Get us started. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the November Minnesota Safe Routes to School Network call. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here briefly uh, to welcome you all. As many of you know, uh, this network call, who are we? The Minnesota Safe Routes to School Network uh, is hundreds of dedicated professionals from across the state that are advancing safe routes to school. We're building skills, um, to implement safe routes to school uh, programming and infrastructure that includes supporting partnerships um, between agencies, advocacy organizations, schools, parents, municipalities, everybody, um, and making Minnesota a state where all students uh, can walk and bike on routes that are safe, comfortable, and convenient. For our November network call today, I am doing the welcome. Uh, we have uh, some great presentations on a topic I'm really excited about, which is accept accessibility in, in walking and biking to school. Um, so we'll start off with a brief update uh, from MinDOT, uh, from Dave over at MinDOT, and then we will turn it over to Angie Powell from MPS to talk a little bit about the Minneapolis Public Schools Adaptive Bike Day. Um, and then we'll hear from Angela Olson over at Bike Min about the Walk Bike Fun curriculum and accessibility in walking and biking. So. Uh, we've got a very full agenda. We'll we'll have questions and discussions as we go through, and maybe a little bit of dedicated time for that at the end. Um, but really, really excited for today's topic. I think it's one of those ones that's near and dear to my heart in terms of uh, you know thinking about uh, accessible communities that everybody can be a part of and access easily. Um, I personally was hit by a car in 2015 and so had a period of time where I had really, really limited mobility. And so <clears throat> accessibility is just like a topic that I, I, I uh, really personally resonate with and I'm very excited to, to hear more about from folks. So uh, with that, uh, unless we have any initial questions, I think I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Angie to talk about the MPS Adaptive Bike Day. Sure. Oh, you, you might've skipped me. But that's okay. Oh, no. I can Gosh, go at I the mean, end. I did. I went through the agenda and then I skipped you. I was just so excited, Dave. I'm sorry. It's all right. It's I know it's okay. Not, Why the don't... Mid update is not going to be exciting also. But I didn't I feel like I should have just let it go and and come back on later on. In fact, how about I do that? Angie, I think you're you're ready and queued up. Why don't you why don't you go for it? We'll mend that update at the end. Well, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Angie Powell. I'm from Minneapolis Public Schools, and I also live in Minneapolis, so I'm excited to join this group um, to make more connections for our students and families in Minneapolis. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Um, it's a Google site that I've just created because uh, I've been in this position um, for 13 years, and we, I had to have kind of put everything in one centralized location. So, and I will share this site with you. It's available to anybody. Um, when I'm done, I think I'll kind of go through a few things. So hopefully we can all see the screen. Are we ready to roll? Yeah. I can okay. see the screen, which I, and I see other folks nodding. So we seem good. Perfect. So again, my name is Angie Powell. Um, I've worked in Minneapolis Public Schools for 26 years. Um, and, and in this role, uh, my current role is lead for um, adapted physical education, or sometimes it's called developmental adapted physical education. And there's 18 of us in that department and it's great. Uh, we provide special ed services um, for kids ages three to 21 across the whole district. And fortunately, a lot of us have worked together for at least the last decade. So we've been able to pull together what's called the Minneapolis Public Schools Bike Days or Adapted Bike Days. Um, kind of the names have changed over the years because we've been at it for a while and we try to be inclusive, but we also kind of try to normalize it for the kids that um, it's not something special. We want you to be able to do this uh, year round. So with everything, we've kind of evolved with the name um, throughout the year. So if you hear different things, that's why. Um, but getting back to that, um, Within the department, we have those 18 teachers, and we've just really worked hard over the years to get this up and running. Um, we started in about 2010, we think, and we had two schools, and it was Justice Page and Washburn, and it, we did it on the track between um, the school, and we did it on one day. And now last year, we had four days, and we had 28 schools, so kids from 28 schools join. And we are trying to really work on our um, late elementary, 
middle school students and high school and some transition plus students, which are 18 to 21 year olds, that they get to come and they get to ride independently on the track and they get to try a bunch of different bikes on that day and just, you know, be independent um, as much as they can with their peers. So I'm just going to start by showing you a few pictures from last year, just to give you a visual of what it actually looks like. Um, so you can see we're on the Edison High School track. There's a few reasons for that. Safety, the surface. Um, some of our students uh, are do need more support. So we have it's, uh, there's fences around it so they can't ride off. Um, and we try to keep those conditions as safe as possible because some of the bikes are new to them and they you know, might need a higher level of support. So you can see we have everything from a three wheel tricycles to um, side by sides, to hand pedal. Just gonna scroll through a few pictures here. This bike here, we just got last year. We're very excited. We teamed up with Special Olympics. So some of our students with uh, more uh, cerebral palsy or mobility issues, they can um, just sit and they don't have to worry as much about biking, but they get that experience about being out, um, feeling, seeing what it feels like to be on a bike. So just some of our, the bikes that we've worked hard for. And as a department, we have worked hard to get these adapted bikes. We've fundraised over the years. We've had people, parents give us bikes. Um, um, Bike Minnesota has given us bikes. Uh, Julie Danzel, I see you. You've helped us fundraise for or get bikes through grants. So grateful for that. And these bikes are kept at the school, each school, um, so that the kids get to bike throughout the year. Um, and then when we do this as a kind of an event for a few reasons, one is that the kids get to try different bikes as they're growing. And two, um, we also use this as we do a pre-maintenance when they, we, I have all the bikes delivered by grounds and transportation to Edison High School or wherever we're having it. And I know a few bike uh, mechanics, they come, they help us repair a bunch of bikes before, and then we do a repair when they leave and then they're, they're transferred back to that Edison, to their, to their schools. So, um, I'm going to quick go back to that site and I'm going to just go through some of the details. But before I do that, is there any questions about anything that I've said so far? As I was saying, saying the DAPE teachers kind of, we run this whole event with the support of the special ed directors um, and superintendent Rochelle Cox was our special ed director for years and I've known her for years and she's always been very supportive of this day because we have to provide transportation for our students. It's like a field trip. They sign up, um, We I help get the field trip buses set up. The students are dropped off um, and you know this is students with wheelchairs. So it's a specialized busing to get them there and then to get them back to the school. So um, those are kind of the, some of the nitty gritty details that we have to work on, but I just wanted to share those with everybody. So those are the dates that it's at Edison High School track this year. Um, some of the other things we really work on is getting volunteers. The past few years for COVID, we haven't um, had as many volunteers, but we will have up to um, 60 to 80 volunteers. And um, we just ask that people sign up this way, what days, what times, and then, what would you like to do? Would you like to uh, help with students on bikes? Would you like to help with helmets? Or would you like to stay safety as safety, somebody helping with safety on the track? Another thing we do for the teachers is they have to help us sign up for buses, help us um, get information out to parents. We have to do permission slips. We have to do information with nurses to get them on that field trip. And then also to help us move the bikes to and from Edison. So these are just some things that we do with, uh, that I wanted to share again, behind the scenes. Angie, um, you have yeah. a sense, like, could you give us a sense of like, how many, how many people is it taking to make this happen? This seems like a huge, huge undertaking and you're talking about volunteers and teachers and obviously like you have a huge role and um yeah I just, I'm just curious like how many people are making this happen because it looks like a huge undertaking so starting with the schools last year we had 28 schools so it's kind of the date teacher and some special ed teachers 
from that school, but the DAPE teachers, the 18 in the department are the ones that are really, we start way back at the beginning of the school year, we started getting the dates, setting up transportation. Um, so it's us on the ground uh, and then support from our supervisors as well. But then I do try to get anywhere between 50 and 80 volunteers. I would love to have at least 25 for each day um, to help out. So does that answer your question? It does, that's a big group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Safety is our number one. We just want kids to feel safe and successful and then bike independently, try the different bikes, but also be safe as we're doing it. And then I think you just saw a picture flash by. We usually have those two bike mechanics, one from Transition Plus and one is Jack Strauss from Strauss Bikes and Skates in North St. Paul. He's just always come out and help us. So um, they're big being into that too. So I'm going to just scroll down and say a couple other things about it. The way we have fundraised as um, we I have an Achieve Minneapolis account and there's a link there. People can financially donate or we just always are taking getting bikes. I actually bought a truck because I drove a Prius forever, but I was like, I so many times I just have to go pick up bikes and then deliver them to a school. So uh, that's kind of the way this is run. It's very grassroots and our goal is just to get kids biking in their communities so this middle picture here is one is our physical education teacher marty grimes she's at lindale you probably know many probably know her and then the picture above that is a, quite a few of our day teachers so we're all just working together um, to pull this together so i just wanted to say a couple other things and then i can talk about one of our other new partnerships but um here in this middle section i have some bike lessons during covid I wanted to share out some things that kids could do with their families, possibly, and also that the teachers could share out when we did distance learning. So this is information from then, um, and it's a lot of the Bike Minnesota information. If there's any links you think I could add, please share them. Then I also have past bike day. Um, we made some virtual tours during COVID. We also did, um, and I had some way back to 2013, some videos and also 2017 bike day photos. And then CARE 11 in 2019, they did a story with on us as well. So just keep adding to that. And then I also wanna always include, you know, for families bike information from Minneapolis because we definitely want students out biking in their communities as much as possible to help support that. Um, so any other questions about the day, the bike day, days? Um, I can go into the different types of bikes a little bit more, but there's a whole variety. If anybody wants more information on that, that's probably a different meeting. Um, but also I did want to share a new thing that we just started um, in March of 2020 during COVID. Many of you probably know Twin Cities Adapted Cycling, TCAC, and their lead is Cato. Um, she called me and said, hey, I'm thinking about moving our site off of the Greenway uh, down by Anderson School. Um, and you know of a possible different location? And I said, hang on, wait a second. So we worked together and we found um, Sullivan and Anishinaabe site. So a year ago, they, um, Minneapolis Public Schools put down the concrete and we wrote some agreements um, and TCAC moved their shipping containers and their bike mechanic there, and they are now having their clients right off the greenway there, and the agreement is that they can be housed there if Minneapolis Public Schools school students can also use this, and it was just that next um, level for our students, in my view, is we have you on the track, we have you at your school, we have you on the track, now we really want to have you try and do some more biking on the Greenway. And as I told you earlier, I really hope to somehow um, duplicate this on the north side in Victory Memorial Parkway, some way up there. So always trying to do both sides of the city and have more access for our students. But if you wanna take a look at some of these photos, we did our fall professional development there and our plan is uh, how can we get more students there biking on the Greenway um, with Cato and it is a you're at, the students are on a side by side and they're biking together with either a peer that's qualified or a professional um, uh, sorry an SEA a special education assistant or a teacher and they'll bike out on the greenway as far as they can and get that opportunity but parents you also can go anytime that Cato is open 
um, you can take up um, the opportunity and go over there and bike with her. So we're just building this now, but it's a, another thing that came out of the adaptive bike days. So, um, yeah, so I think that's mainly uh, the points that I wanted to share. Again, we are really just trying to get kids to work on their gross motor skills. You know, we work with physical education teachers who are doing a lot of biking now too, which is great. And our, we're trying to purchase those bikes so that um, they can go out with their peers too. But again, safety is our number one um, issue and making sure that we have the bikes as well. Because we, we know that we have to do better for our students and particularly our students with disabilities. So we are working really hard to do better. Um, so yeah, and I'm always just trying to kind of build on this and looking for more partners. So at this time I can take any questions or um, like we can also put this link in the chat too, if that helps. There was a, there was a request that you share the link to this page in the, in the chat, um, Angie. Sure. Uh, and while you do that, I have I have a question for you. I think you said you went from two schools to twenty eight schools over the past ten years. I'm wondering if you can like bring us back to when you were trying to get it started at two schools. Um, like, did it take a lot of internal advocacy? Was it a heavy lift, or did you just start doing it? I'm gonna stop sharing quick. Um, you know, it was a special ed teacher. I believe her name is Naomi. She's not Ann Watton, but she said, you know, hey, can't we ride out on the track? And the Dave teacher was like, yeah, great idea. Um, and then, the, so we just did it one day. And then the next year, there was one woman in the state, and I forgot, I think her name was Heather Marks, and she brought out five bikes, and we added two more schools that year. Um, and I have to say that, yeah, some of those behind the scenes things are really hard. Uh, getting departments in our district to work together and getting the, the field trip buses done and the bikes moved the first year. I rented a U-Haul the first couple of years to get those bikes trans transferred on time because I was very worried. And I was worried that I just fundraised for some of these bikes and I didn't want them to disappear. So I was scared of those things. But once I kind of let that go and just let people help, because a lot of people were super interested in it. Um, I just, I, for me, it was a little bit of a control thing, but I do think there's so many people that want to help and be a part of it that now it's just taken off. But in the beginning, um, it was really difficult, but then I feel like some things fell into place for us and connections, and we created those t-shirts um, to recognize a few people in the district, and that was our logo, and it just kind of took off, and um, people wanted to be a part of it, so, yeah. But yeah, there were definitely challenges in the beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I did see one question in the chat about your dates for spring 2023. Are you all, do you already have them? You're planned? You're ready to go? So I think we're keeping those four, same four days, which is odd. The 23rd through the 20, let me look real quick. I don't want to tell you the wrong date. Yep. Um, we're going the 23rd, which is a Tuesday, through the 26th, which is a Friday. And we have to do it kind of shorter days because field trips only run, field trip buses only run from 9.30 to 1.30. Mm -hmm. So to get our kids there and back. Um, and that's one of the things I really wanna work on is somehow getting more transportation for our students. Like I'd love to be able to pick them up at the end of the day and take them over to Cato's uh, biking. I, I coached adaptive athletics for a long time. And it was, that was one of our things was getting kids busing and getting them to and from their school to the event and then home. So yeah, that's the next thing on the list is hopefully working with a community partner on that a little bit more. Yep. Speaking of community partners, I'm, I'm sorry to keep dominating this space here with questions, but I'm super interested. Um, so for, so for folks on the call that are, uh, you know, outside of Minneapolis and maybe they're interested in trying to start something like this, do you have any recommended community groups that, that you know happen to exist in other places that are good resources to, to try and start something like this? I just shared that site. Um, okay, can you ask me, can you say that again? I'm sorry. 
Um, just wondering if you have any recommendations for folks that are working outside of Minneapolis uh, for nonprofit organizations that might um, have like d disability advocacy or something as a part of their mission that people could work with to to try and emulate what you all have done in Minneapolis. Sure. So I would probably if you do have like a pacer or a local group, I would start there and I would try to find like a family or that's super into biking, somebody that has that knowledge in the background and just grow it from there. But as far as community partners, I would go with Special Olympics. They're always willing to partner up with you on various educational projects. Um, they've been very helpful with some some things that I've done um, as far as getting equipment, because uh, that's the biggest thing is trying to find bikes. But I have free that free bikes, I forgot what it's called now. I apologize. Free bikes for um free bikes for kids, maybe. Yep, yep. They I have specifically said, hey, do you have any um tricycles or adapted bikes? And they've they've uh, worked to try and find those as well for us. But um yeah, those are my main folks that I go to, or I'll go to a certain bike shop. And um, what helped me is I found somebody in the bike shops and said, hey, do you know anything about adapted cycling? And I just kind of started building from there. So I don't know. But the school is the big one, the, the various people in the schools. Our special education um, transition plus building, which is services 18 to 20 year olds, they actually have a bike mechanic there that works on adapted bikes and various bikes too. So um, we're kind of pulling from within. Sorry, I don't have any more. Um, I don't know. That was a, that was a great list. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll have to think on that. But, yeah. yeah, and if you want to come out and volunteer, it's you're always welcome. Again, we're just community trying to support our students. Is your form active right now for volunteer signups for Meg? No, no I need to do that. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll send that out with the with the notes and the link in case anybody wants to come experience firsthand. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I see a note from Jill in the chat that Jill has volunteered before. Jill, uh, can I put you on the spot if you're if you're at your microphone and ask you to talk a little bit about what it is like to be a volunteer for this? Yeah. Sure. I will. Here's my recollection. Besides my love of a free t-shirt, it was like living in the future because the bikes were really cool. Not like not superficially cool, but like you saw all the differences. You think a tricycle is just a tricycle. And then there were all these different configurations of it. And then watching the enthusiasm of these kids who were like, I want to ride this one. I want to try this. And they just were in it and the teachers were really because sometimes kids would want to ride the bike that wasn't right for them. And the teacher or the like the support folks were really excellent at redirecting, but in a way that just stayed encouraging. So you didn't see kids dejected like, well, I can't ride that bike because it's actually meant for somebody that has a, a different kind of body or something. Um, and I'm also pretty type A and it was such a well organized event that it was really relaxing to come like to come into um because sometimes I go to people's events and I really want to reset up their tables for them so that's me that's my baggage um so like it just it was really fun and I, I Dave I can't remember if you were with us I I think Ellen I feel like I was volunteering with other people I recall Michelle from you told such a good story about it that I went the next year Oh, did I? Okay. Yeah, See, uh -huh. there we go. No, so I, I loved it. And I do really think um, if you are trying to figure out how you could do this, I think volunteering would be a great way to go. And you mentioned Cato um, with Twin Cities Adaptive Cycling. She's phenomenal, um, generous with her knowledge uh, and just, you know, there's you there are folks trying to do this and I think it's it's an unending piece of work because again our bodies come in all shapes and sizes and all different abilities and then also the technology keeps changing and so it's it's something there's always something different we could be doing and bodies keep changing also it's not just oh lord I people I turned 50 and it's just happened it's <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, I'm signing off or not signing off. I'm just gonna go quiet. Thanks, Jill. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Awesome. Well, we are almost at the midpoint. Um, Angie, I see that you put your email in the chat. Is that an invitation for folks to reach out to you if they have questions or just you know want to be excited about your work? Yeah, please. Um, I will try to get that volunteer um, form up and ready to roll and, and the dates more firm. But yes, please just email. email. And that's kind of how I roll is that I just want to, again, I want it to be grassroots and yeah, absolutely. So thanks. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. This was a great presentation. I feel like there's just like a lot to digest about uh, all the different sort of aspects of this event. And um, I don't know, there was just so much, so much stuff here that's like philosophical, but also like the logistics of doing something like this is there's just a lot to think about um, in bringing together partners and like physically transporting people and things and finding places. And uh, this is just a lot. So thanks for all your work uh, and for giving us some insight into how you make it happen. Thanks for having me. Cool. Um, with that, uh, I think we will move on to our uh, the second part of Team Angela, Team Angie. Uh, <laughs> Angela Olson uh, from Bike Min is going to talk to us a little bit about Walk Bike Fun curriculum, accessibility. Um, I, I will just like let Angela go. I don't even think I need to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Melissa, and thanks, Angie. Yeah, I um really want to echo what folks have said about Adaptive Bike Day. Uh, one of the first projects that I worked on when I started at Bike and Men was to, I was at all four days of this previous um, Adaptive Bike Day, and it was so great. Um, like Jill mentioned, it is like being in the future. Any kind of bike that you can imagine a need for exists out there in the field at Edison, either through some kind of like MacGyvering of and Frankensteining of bikes or something that's been manufactured. Um, I tell this story a lot, but my favorite thing that I saw was the wheelchair tandem that I saw out there uh, where the person who sits in the wheelchair where their feet go was pedals. And I just, I don't know, it just tickles me every time I think about it. So uh, we, uh, I was there doing some evaluation with um, professional data analytics, which is also a neighbor of Edison High School. And, um, I, we had a really nice summary of the day. We interviewed kids, we had them draw pictures, we interviewed volunteers. I know Angie has that um, information. So if you're interested in seeing more about that, I'm happy to share that as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, my name is Angela Olson. I'm the education director here at Bike and Men. I've been here since uh, March. So about nine or 10 months now. Um, a little bit about me at Cycling has been my primary mode of transportation since I was 17 years old. I'm also a person living with a chronic illness that does affect the way I ride my bicycle. Um, I'm also on the steering committee for the Minnesota Access Alliance, which is a organization focused on providing and increasing access primarily at arts and cultural institutions and events. Um, so I have a history of working in disability justice. This is something I love talking about, love learning about. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to kind of share a little bit about how Bike Man is trying to um, continue to make our walk bike fun curriculum as accessible as possible and really empower educators to, with some knowledge and some skills to help kiddos find the bikes that are right for their bodies. Um, so I'm going to share my screen for a little bit and I will um, really briefly kind of show you our adaptive toolkit that is in our curriculum. Um, some of you might know this already, but our curriculum was just updated. So our lessons have been expanded. We've got 12 pedestrian lessons and 12 cycling lessons geared towards ages um, kindergarten through eighth grade. We've got lessons tailored towards each grade level. Um, CJ Linder, my colleague and I just did our first um, training of the season with this new curriculum two weeks ago in Hutchinson and it went super well. People were super engaged. And a huge part of this is this adaptive toolkit that um, is not only a supplement to the curriculum, but also influences the curriculum and the activities throughout it. So I'll just give you kind of a peek as to what that looks like. Um, uh, so this is our adaptive toolkit. Again, in our physical copies of the curriculum, it's towards the back near our resource guide. Um, I'll just walk you through it to kind of give you an idea of what's inside of it. Um, normally when we do our walk bike fun trainings, I go through this with educators and we take at least 20 to 30 minutes to talk about it. I will not take that long now, but um, some of this might be really interesting, especially as we get towards the end and talk about resources. So 
the um, acknowledgments page just lists all the experts that lent their knowledge and expertise to making this possible. A lot of people lended their expertise to inform and influence what this adaptive toolkit became. And so here's just a list of a few of them. Um, you'll notice my fellow A team member, Andy Powell, on here. Um, some other names might be familiar with you. And um, we kind of start off with a note from Bonnie Paul, who's a parent of a kiddo. And she just talks about the influence and the impact that her kiddo finding a bike that worked for his body, what the, what the impact was for him, right? Just the freedom, the ability to fit in with his peers, the ability to feel independent and um, experience the fun that is riding a bike. Because after all, it's super fun to ride a bike, especially if you can find one that fits your body. So um, this curriculum, by the way, is available in a PDF version on our walkbikefun.org website. I'll share a bunch of links at the end when I'm done speaking. Um, so when you need a little pick me up in your heart, you can uh, check out this note from Bonnie Paul because it is really um, heartwarming. Um, then we just talk a little bit about some words to remember when working with people with disabilities. Um, essentially the main thing that we kind of drive home is just like every person is unique, every person's disability is unique and every representation or experience of a disability is also unique. So one person with uh, you know, cerebral palsy might not have the same type of um, physical experiences or manifestations as another kiddo with cerebral palsy. So it means that you really have to look at each person as an individual and there's some trial and error to figure out what's gonna be the best use of um, or best fit for them and their bodies. Um, so this is just a little bit of some advice for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with or don't work closely with a uh, Dave teacher or don't have that resource in their school. Um, and then we talk a little bit about the differences when kiddos are first learning to ride with disabilities. A lot of adaptive bikes are bigger. They have their brakes maybe in a different spot. They might take longer to stop. They tend to need to take turns wide and slow. So we really encourage people to kind of make some adaptations um, when teaching folks with disabilities how to ride for the first time. Um, and it's really not super different <laughs> from teaching anybody else or um, the learn to ride section that's in the curriculum. It's just some additional information that can be helpful when you're working with um, folks with disabilities. And then we've got a whole list that is not by any means comprehensive, but is pretty thorough on common disabilities, the ways that they kind of typically can present themselves, and then different bikes that are a good kind of starting point to try out with your students. So we kind of go through several different types of disabilities. This is kind of what's common with them. Here's a bike you might want to try. And when we work with teachers, I oftentimes say like, kiddos are really good at know, you know, knowing what they like and what they don't like and giving you feedback. So these are just kind of jumping off points. It's not to say that for sure that's going to be the right bike. It's really just a good place to start. Um, so we've got a pretty big list of those that teachers have told us is pretty helpful and informative. And then um, a list and pictures of some of the common adaptive bikes and equipment. Um, bike MN actually recently just acquired two additional adaptive bikes. So we have nine in our fleet right now. Um, we have some trikes. We have a side-by-side -side tandem, which my colleague Ted and I are actually going to deliver to Ann Sullivan right after this meeting. Um, we've got a couple of hand cycles. We just got a um, wheelchair tandem, which I'm super excited about. And then we have a lot of um, balance bikes, as well as some adaptive pedals and some training wheels that can be put onto um, almost any bike and turn it into a four wheel bike. We also have a, a two wheel tandem that we got from Free Bikes for Kids that uh, we've refurbished and is available as well. And all of these bikes are available in our fleet so that when folks go through the walk bike fund training, they can request the um, technical assistance of using these bikes. Um, and then after that, we have some just additional safety considerations, more tips and tricks, you know, being aware of latex allergies for grips or talking about, um, you know, uh, autonomic dysreflexia, which is something that people with spinal cord injuries might present um, when their body basically is sending signals to different parts of their body because they don't feel from the waist down um, and how those kind of might present. 
And then this is the part that might be helpful for y'all as we talk about um, resources and retailers. A couple that I want to point out, All Ability Cycles down in Jefferson, Iowa, is the person that we got our two newest bikes from. His name is John. Super helpful, knowledgeable, patient. Um, Twin Cities Adaptive Cycling obviously is a partner of ours that we work with a lot. And then Strider Bikes. Um, we utilize our balance bikes a lot, especially when folks are learning to ride and even in our adults um, learn to ride classes. And then I wanna just give you a little bit of an example of how the kind of adaptive toolkit informs the rest of the curriculum. So here's an example of a lesson on um, riding defensively in our bike fun section. There's some handling skills, yielding, turning, um, avoiding hazards. And then down at the bottom here, we have this call out box that gives some suggestions for activity modifications. So every lesson that has an activity or almost every lesson has some type of activity modification or suggestions to be like, hey, if you've got a, a kiddo with um, paresis, here are some ideas. Or if you've got a blind student, here are some ideas to make this accessible to them. So that's throughout the entirety of the curriculum, all 24 lessons. So I'm gonna stop sharing for now. Um, I'm gonna put a couple of, um, oh, thank you. I see that CJ has put the curriculum um, in the, the link to download the curriculum in the chat. I'm also going to put a blog post down in the chat. This is um, a blog post about our adaptive fleet and just more information on how people can utilize it, um, request it. We really want those bikes to be out being used. Um, so it's available as a technical assistance totally for free. And CJ is the person that manages all of that. So you talk to a real life person to figure out um, you know, how to get bikes to you. So, um, and then I'll also finally just put our walk bike fun.org um, website in the chat that is more information about the training itself the curriculum we have space to take on more trainings this um, fall and even into the winter we have been working on adapting the way that we deliver our programming so some of you might know there is a two-part model right now with an asynchronous portion that folks take online and then we come in person and go through the curriculum um, and practice activities hands-on. But we also have done models where we deliver part of it over Zoom and then come again later to do the handling skills. We can do things, in, a large part of it we can do in a gym. So we don't have to go outside if it's winter and we can come back in the spring and um, finish up any like group riding or other needs that we didn't need to get to meet at that time. So we're really open and flexible trying to make this accessible and relevant um, to all the educators. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about our adaptive curriculum, how we've been utilizing it. You know, when we go through this with teachers, we actually have them do an activity where we have some bios of different students with disabilities written by the students themselves. And we show them to the educators and have them practice pairing a bike or bikes that might work for that student. And then we talk about why. So we really try to kind of keep the conversation going about how to make pedestrian and biking safety and education accessible, interesting and relevant and fun for all students. So I think that sums up everything I wanna say about it. Um, any you questions? Went, you went very fast, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is great because there's a, there's a lot there. Um, I'm wondering if uh, before I sort of turn it over to anybody else for questions, you could talk a little bit about the curriculum and kind of like accessibility and walking uh, we've mm -hmm. talked a lot about biking today and I'm just, I'm curious about yeah. how, how that shows up or things that you're thinking about or principle, you know, there's a lot of principles mm -hmm. here that I think are really universal in terms of like, if there's a problem, it's not like a problem with your body. It's a problem with the bike. Or right. The uh, but just, yeah, curious what your thoughts are. Right. Yeah. No, thank you for that reminder. Um, I tend to focus on the biking when I'm in this um, space, but it is important to note that half of our curriculum is dedicated to pedestrian safety. So walking, walking and rolling, um, you know, one thing I can show you an example of, I can share my screen again, um, is again, those kind of call out box activity modifications are throughout the entirety of the curriculum. So here is, for example, one of the lessons in the walk fun section of the curriculum. Uh, it's a neighborhood walk, just practicing, taking a look at the neighborhood, taking a look at things around you, 
going on a walk together. Um, and then there's a couple different activities here where kiddos can learn how to cross the street safely that involve doing different gestures or things like that. And here's an activity modification right here to kind of give you a suggestion for uh, some students might want to do a different indication of, you know, their um, instead of walking, they might want to clap or nod or things like that. We also talk about, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. There is also a lot of, um, especially in the older part of the curriculum, we do like a neighborhood walking assessment where we actually look at is the neighborhood um, or is the sidewalk wide enough for a wheelchair user or for people to walk side by side? Is the street well maintained? Um, are things like safe for somebody to move around? So we do talk about that, like kind of empowering the students to think critically, especially as they get older about infrastructure. So like you pointed to Alyssa, it's not somebody's body that's the issue, right? Disability really becomes a problem. The world is not accommodating of it, right? Using a wheelchair isn't necessarily on its own problematic, but if you don't have a wheelchair ramp, then it is, or if it's wrong, uh, the wrong inc incline, right? Um, so we do kind of look at some of those things as well. And again, the whole point of the curriculum is really to empower students and to give teachers the skills and confidence to be able to do that. So that kind of critical thinking about specifically infrastructure and thinking about adaptive equipment or mobility aids as a, another means to navigate the world is something that we want to try to do. Hi, Angela. This is Allison Kanigi. I work for Minneapolis Public Schools. Um, Hi, Allison. I'm, a, I'm a travel instructor and orientation and mobility specialist for the district. Is oh, that awesome. um, is that part of the curriculum that like environmental analysis part is that included in the curriculum because that would just be really great for me as an instructor to have as like considerations that I need to take into account when I'm planning a route for a student to learn mm -hmm. is that included yeah so okay. I'll try and find it here too but okay. it's in I believe it's one of the last lessons um okay. is you know we we work on kind of like the safety aspect we work on personal safety, kind of like threats that you might encounter, as well as not being distracted when you're walking. And all of those skills kind of build up to different types of walks, either destination walks or walks around the neighborhood. And in that um, final section of, I believe, the like six to eight age range or six to eight grade range, um, the final lesson is going on a neighborhood walk using an excessive or a neighborhood like checklist to actually have the students check off like oh I saw trees that were blocking the sidewalk or the sidewalk was really craggly and hard to get around or things like that so that is definitely in there yep awesome thank you so much I'm so excited to use this with my students yay uh, I'm just going to give a quick scroll through the chat. I don't think I have seen any questions, but lots of good, lots of good links uh, from the bike MN team. So thank you all. Um, mm -hmm. I think one thing that I, I want to ask a question that knowing that like, there's probably not a good answer for this. Uh, oh, uh, I'll hold my question because I see a question um, about, uh, can this curriculum be used for children from birth to five younger kids? Yeah. So right now, this curriculum starts at kindergarten. We are, in, I have been in talks with um, so, some folks at the state about potentially adding some like pre-K. I definitely think, especially in the learning to ride section, there are things that could be utilized. Um, it's not explicitly called out that way in the curriculum because like I said, it was designed for K through eighth grade. Um, but if you are have some particular interest and want some help thinking about um, how some of these things could be used for kiddos that age, feel free to contact me and we can work on something. Um, but principles of safety, kind of like the essentials of crossing the streets, um, and then some of the learning to ride essentials on balancing um, could definitely be applied to younger kiddos. Cool. And all of the ad adaptations and activity modifications um, could definitely benefit younger students as well. So, Yeah, I uh, briefly worked at a well, not briefly for like seven years worked in the office at a preschool and there were lots of kiddos on balance bikes so mm -hmm. uh, they're three and four <laughs> doing their thing so uh yeah to the point in, you made in one of the page about not one of the pages about not underestimating kiddos they they can do quite a lot 
Yeah. Um, here knows. <laughs> yeah. We always recommend starting off with balance bikes for almost for everyone or like in our adult program, we actually just take the pedals off and it's a great way to, to learn balance or reaffirm balance. If you are in a situation where suddenly you're having a hard time with your balance, um, practicing on a balance bike is really great. Um, your hips will be very sore if you ride for a long time though. They definitely take different muscles than a bike with pedals. Awesome. Uh, any, so we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure Dave has enough time for the MnDOT update that I just breezed by earlier because I was so excited um, about Team Angie. Um, do you have any other closing thoughts for us, Angela? I see you also put your email in the chat and I'm going to uh, extend that as an invitation to the group that if they have questions that they can reach out. Yeah, absolutely. I, like I mentioned before, I love talking about this. I love learning about it. I love thinking about how we can continue to adapt. Like what I showed you, the adaptive curriculum, I, I like to consider it like alive, right? So as we learn more and have more experiences with more teachers, we can continuously add to and modify it. And it's really helpful for us to get that feedback as we're working towards, you know, kind of the best version of the curriculum that we can do. Um, again, if there have been any barriers to participation in Walk Bike Fun in the past that you want to talk to us about, we have the capacity right now to be really flexible and adaptive. Um, and then finally, I'm going to be at the MinShape conference next week. So come visit me um, if you want to do a little hands-on practice. And, um, and yeah, I'm available. So Awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, just again, like a lot, a lot of wisdom shared on this call today and, and really excited about uh, how folks are going to think about this stuff and bring it back to their work. Dave, are you feeling ready for the MnDOT update? <laughs> yeah, not nearly as interesting as Team Angie. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I hope there was, I hope those of you on the call today were feeling as inspired as I was both by kind of what's happening on the ground in Minneapolis with Angie's work and um, what's been going on with the Walk Bike Fund curriculum with Angela and CJ's work. Uh, and you might be thinking like, well, how do I do this where I am? And, and you might have even scrolled uh, onto the internet and started to look up adaptive bicycles, or maybe you downloaded the curriculum while everybody was talking. And maybe that price tag scared you a little bit. <laughs> it certainly has scared me a couple of times. And it, and it, it does speak to why you know, Angie was talking about the fundraising necessary. Uh, which is a great time to point out the fact that our boost solicitation, our program implementation solicitation here at MnDOT is open through the end of November with applications due on November 30th. And I, you know, the work um, that we've heard about today is just so important um, for implementing equitable uh, and inclusive safe routes to school programs. Um, and so if you're if you've been thinking about a bike fleet uh, and you're planning to apply for boost grant, uh, I would highly encourage you to ensure that there is at least one, if not several adaptive bicycles as a part of that bike fleet. Uh, and perhaps you've got a, a project or a program that you're working on that is all adaptive and, uh, and is something that you're thinking about uh, submitting for a boost grant. Either way, make sure that you do it by November 30th. Um, you're going to want to keep it in the, the price range that we have there between five and $50,000 um, and ensure and get that applica application in on time. Uh, with a little bit later timeline, we do have our planning assistance grant solicitation open as well. That's due January 11th of 2023. So you've got more time there if you're trying to think about how to focus um, your efforts. Uh, definitely lean in uh, heavily on Boost. And then finally, if, if any of you were watching, I always, I always have so much fun when walk and bike and roll to school day happens around the state of Minnesota. Um, if you're not following Minnesota Safe Routes to School on Facebook, you definitely should. Uh, there's tons of photos from all of the different events um, that were happening across the state. We had over 160 schools that registered statewide, and usually that registration number is lower than the actual participation from schools. So um, have a scroll through the photos there, see all the all the fun schools had and the different things that they did to celebrate walking and biking. And I think that's the extent of uh, of a MnDOT update for today. If you have any questions about uh, grant solicitations or applications, you can reach out to me. I'll drop my email in the chat here in a second. 
chat is just popping with useful links today. Uh, may, uh, we'll make sure to gather all those up and send them out uh, with with the post call email so that if you missed one of them, uh, you'll you'll still have it. Um, I will do a couple uh, slides to close us out this morning. Um, uh, a reminder that, uh, as Dave reminded me last month, that the Safe Routes to School National Summit for 2022 is online uh, in just a couple weeks. So if you want to connect with Safe Routes folks working uh, across the, the United States, not just in Minnesota, that would be a great opportunity for um, you all to do that. Uh, our next call, uh, still first Thursdays of the month through the end of the year, so Thursday, December 1st, uh, we're going to be doing our network survey results and analysis. So um, for those of you on the email list, Julie has been sending out the survey link. Um, and if you haven't taken the survey yet, it's a really, really helpful tool for us to get a sense of how useful the calls are, what we might focus on in 2023, structural changes we might make. So really an important opportunity for us to get your feedback and your perspective on how the calls are working, um, because you know there are only like six of us who plan the calls. <laughs> um, and we really, really want your perspective and your insights into you know, where we can be taking, taking these conversations strategically uh, and to meet the needs of all the folks uh, doing all the great safe routes work. Uh, we are not going to have a meeting in January. The first th third thing in January is going to be right after many schools are on break or perhaps during break. Um, and we will get out a schedule for 2023 after we go through the network survey results in December. So hope to see you all on the call. Um, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your Thursday. Thanks for joining us and take care.